Now, here are details of some of this week's programmes. Tomorrow morning in 5 to 10, the prophet Isaiah will be telling the story of David Kossoff. <laughs> at 11.30, a sanitary engineer will be talking about leaks at the Admiralty. <laughs> In Movie Go Round, there'll be excerpts from the new musical based on the story of Henry VIII and his six wives. It is entitled The King and I, and I, and I, and I, and I. <laughs> Meanwhile, for those of you who are more easily pleased, here is 30 minutes of star-studded rubbish as we take you round the hall. <laughs> the story so far. Wizened, blue-chinned Betty Marsden <laughs> received a mysterious invitation scrawled on the back of a cocker spaniel played by Hugh Paddock on all fours. As she looked at the envelope, a small tremor ran down her spine and fluttered up the chimney, clucking furiously. <laughs> Who was the letter from? Was it from Romany Bill Pertwee, he of the gypsy stock with nine good ingredients? <laughs> or was it perhaps... Or was it perhaps from petite gamin Kenneth Williams? <laughs> she tore open the envelope, and there, scrawled in a rude hand across the page, was the news she dreaded to hear. This is Kenneth Hall. <laughs> and welcome again to Round the Horn. That was Douglas Smith, who appears by permission of the Hampstead Garden suburb branch of the Arab League. <laughs> Now, to begin, here are the answers. The answers to last week's quiz. Now, question one was the puzzle picture, and it was, of course, an aerial view of a Frankfurter sausage dressed as Queen Victoria. <laughs> and not, as one of you suggested, Queen Victoria dressed as a Frankfurter sausage. <laughs> question two, the odd man out was, of course, the senna pod. All the others, all the others were prime ministers. <laughs> Question three. This came in six parts, and the answers were no, no, perhaps, sometimes, only by appointment, and yes, but when our husband's on night work. <laughs> now then, where was I? Said he, uh, pretending to make up the script as he goes along. Oh, yes, I know what I was going to tell you. Today marks the centenary of the birth of the crumpets. <laughs> And I would like to pay tribute to Tammany Wilkinshaft, who can with some justification be called the father of the modern crumpets. <laughs> Tammany was a master baker who lived in Nuneaton. <laughs> <laughs> On another occasion, he invented the Garibaldi biscuit, which was named after that great Italian patriot, Luigi Biscuit. <laughs> But he is best known in this country for the crumpets. Now, the... <laughs> the first crumpet was a crude affair. It was square in shape. <laughs> and it hadn't got any holes. <laughs> so, consequently, the butter ran off it. <laughs> and Tammany became known in Nuneaton as the man with the greasy lap. <laughs> But undeterred by the sneers of the townspeople and many parlour maids, Tammany persisted with his crumpet until... <laughs> until in 1880, he perfected the crumpet as we know it today. It was an immediate success, and soon he was getting orders from all over. He was asked to make triangular crumpets for the YWCA. <laughs> Circular crumpets for the round table. And on one occasion, a crumpet shaped like a carpet slipper for his Masonic Lodge. <laughs> but his great moment came when he was asked by Parliament to make a giant one to celebrate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. In honour of the occasion, he built a crumpet that was 15 feet across and 6 foot high. And an added novelty, he hollowed out the centre and a gaiety girl was secreted inside. And when the loyal toast was drunk, she leapt out wearing pink comms and waving a Union Jack. <laughs> Either that or the other way around, I can't remember. <laughs> In any event, the whole thing was a great success, and as many people commented afterwards, it was a smashing bit of crumpet. Well... <laughs> I'm glad I got that off my chest, rather. 
Ah. Now to our feature on the Backroom Boys of the BBC. Whenever listeners or viewers have complaints about programmes, their problems are tackled by a small but important group of people, the Complaints Department. Well, Miss Runcible, any complaints this morning? There's an angry letter from a Mrs. Goldberg complaining about a reference in the radio newsreel to a dangerous outbreak of rabbis in the southeast. Outbreak of rabbis? <laughs> Rabies! <laughs> that announcer again. We really must try and keep Douglas Smith sober. <laughs> Well, what are we going to tell Mrs. Goldberg? Oh, the usual thing, that we're grateful that she should take the trouble to write and that we're instituting a full-scale inquiry immediately and then bung it in the waste paper basket. Anything else? <laughs> well, yes, yes. There's a man outside. He's been waiting to see you since yesterday. Oh, send him in. Oh, would you come in, Mr. Grunt Patek? Grunt Patek, yes. <laughs> Grunt Patek, J.P.'s mould, Grunt Patek, Esquire. I have a complaint. Well, why didn't you write in? I wanted to be intimate with you in person. <laughs> <laughs> you, you ignore my letters. I penned many a missive containing filthy abuse, vulgar innuendo, <laughs> and, and even occasional drawings. <laughs> Not so much as a thank you have I received. Of course, I don't write under my own name. I generally sign myself the Bishop of Bagshot. <laughs> no, it's you, is it? That's, that's me. Yes, I remember your last letter. That's right, yes. Yes, it must admit it seemed odd at the time that a bishop should cherish such uh, peculiar ambitions regarding Barbara Mullen. <laughs> The sex kitten of Tannock Bray. <laughs> oh, the soft swell of the bombazine. Oh, the tantalizing proximity of her. Oh, oh. oh, get him a glass of water, Miss Runcible. Now, uh, Bishop, uh, Mr. Grandfather, uh, this, um, this complaint. Well, it's about the amount of sex and violence and depravity on television. Yes, well, we're doing all we can about it. You may be, but there's still not enough. Can <laughs> 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 you work some more into your programmes? <laughs> Didn't I make it clear in my letter to you? You remember I suggested that Dr. Finley's casebook could do a story where that Dr. Snoddy could ply Barbara Mullen with drink and persuade her to cavort about in a provocative manner, wearing nothing but a wincy at nighty and Wellington. <laughs> I'd enjoy something like that. Yes, oh. no doubt you would. Well, I forward your suggestions to the producer, but I can't promise you anything. That's no, no. what they all say. Look at the plays you put on. Nothing ever happens. Oh. They're all the same. The young man gets this lady of his acquaintance on the couch, and there they are, holding each other close, <laughs> and their lips all puckered up, <laughs> and, uh, painting and muttering, and just as you think, ah, no, this is it, suddenly you're looking at a picture of the sea, dashing on the rocks. <laughs> I don't want to be sat there looking at the sea. I want to be back on that couch where it's all happening. <laughs> but Mr. Grunfather... If I want to look at the sea, I'm going to boom. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be taken out of myself. I want plays that are unfit for people of a nervous disposition or treatment. I want salacious sex and gratuitous violence and filth and swearing and drinking and carrying on and being arrested. <laughs> Your duty to show everyday life as it is. But everyday life isn't like that. Mine is. <laughs> well, it's good to know that the BBC looks after the interests of minorities. And now, um, now to our new feature. Smith, shop. Coming, sir. And now, a new feature, awe-inspiring in its grandeur, breathtaking in its magnificence, sickening in its content. <laughs> Inspector Horn's Casebook. In all the 
annals of crime, there is no murder case more boring than the one I'm going to tell you about tonight. <laughs> In the files of Scotland Yard, it's known as the case of the tap-dancing monk. <laughs> It all started on the night of September the 24th, 1923, in the bathroom at Mallory Grange. Sir Beermoth Gandhi was just climbing into the bath when... <laughs> His housekeeper, a Mrs. Evadne Codpiece, ignored the scream, assuming that the bathwater was too hot. <laughs> But two years later, when he still hadn't come down, <laughs> she began to have the first nagging suspicion that all was not well. But let her tell it in her own words. I began to have the first nagging suspicions that all was not well in the spring of 1925. He had still not come down for his supper. His cocoa had gone quite cold. Oh, dreadful, dreadful. Yes, mm. yes. There's nothing worse than a cold cup of cocoa. No, but it was Foskett, the gardener, who aroused me suspicions. But let Foskett tell it in his own words. Ah. It was I who aroused Mrs. Codpiece's suspicions, uh, amongst other things. <laughs> On the night in question, I was alone with her in the kitchen, nibbling at a plate of baked beans and ogling Mrs. Codpiece. Or was it the other way round? <laughs> no, no, I, no, I was right the first time. Uh, I was in the middle of my baked beans when I rumbled. <laughs> Something unusual was happening. What I rumbled was that for the past two years, water had been seeping through the ceiling until it was lapping about her thighs. <laughs> oh, no, I thought. Summing's up. Sir Beermoth has left his bath tap running. Mrs. Cosby and I did what we had to. And then we called the police. <laughs> Constable Larkspur was summoned and broke down the door, but let him tell it in his own words. I was summoned and I broke down the door. A scene of indescribable confusion greeted my eyes. The deceased laid sprawled on the bathroom floor. He'd been struck repeatedly over the head with a blunt instrument, to wit, a stuffed badger. <laughs> a rubber duck lay in the bath, its neck twisted into unnatural position. Uh, for a rubber duck, that is. <laughs> on its face was an expression of horror. This is the work of some maniac, I thought. Suspended from the cistern, I espied a rude note, obviously left dangling by an assassin. I flushed angrily. <laughs> This, I told myself, was a job for Scotland Yard. Well, Inspector Orme, what do you make of it? Well, Sergeant Fox Tibbet, I'd say that foul play cannot be ruled out. By the way, sir, have you considered the possibility of suicide? Certainly not. If the woman lodges a complaint against me, I shall say that the train lurched and I... Oh, no, I see that. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, I see you mean this case, yes. Oh, <laughs> oh I... Uh... I think we can rule suicide out. After all, the deceased was in good health and of a sound mind, and there seems no reason why he should beat himself repeatedly over the head with a stuffed badger. <laughs> Have you had the uh, badger tested for fingerprints? Yes, but the only fingerprints we found were those of another badger. Uh. <laughs> we, uh, we pulled him in, sir, but uh, he can prove that he was in Whipsnade at the time. If we can find who the stuffed badger belonged to, we've got our man, Fox Tibbet. Well, there was one mark on the animal that might give us a lead, sir. A laundry mark. The Celestial Bagwash Company Limehouse. Good, good. Yes. Well, right, I'll go down there and have a snoop around. Oh, and while I'm gone, put out a call to all stations to keep on the lookout for a small, squat man, about three foot tall, with bright ginger hair, a bulbous nose, a peg leg, an eye patch, and a duelling scar down his left cheek. Is that a description of the assassin? No, just a shot in the dark, but... Uh... <laughs> We don't really want anybody who looks like that wandering around London, do we? <laughs> All right, uh, Fox Tibbet, if, uh, if anyone wants me, tell them I've gone to the Celestial Bagwash to see a man about a badger. Hello, anybody there? Huh? So? You wish to see me? I am the proprietor. Ah, Mr. Celestial Bagwash. I, uh, I wanted a word with you. Uh, 
I am Sen Yat San, son of Sun Yat Sen. May the celestial radiance of your honorable presence transform my humble dwelling, and may my unworthy efforts to please you not meet with your displeasure. No. Yes. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, I'm Inspector Horn of Scotland Yard. Well, well my life wouldn't you say so in the first place? <laughs> scared me. I thought he was a customer. <laughs> what I wanted to know is this. Do you recognise this badger? Uh, yes, it came in last week to be steamed and re-blocked. <laughs> Had a hell of a job to get a crease in the legs. <laughs> it's come up well, hasn't he? Do you remember who... <laughs> Do you remember who brought the badger in? Oh, let me see now. Uh, wait a minute. I'll uh, have a look in the book. Uh, ah, yeah. Uh, it was... Um... <laughs> who? I said it was... Mrs. Evadne Codpiece. Now play! Yes, Inspector. I took that badger to the cleaners, but he wasn't mine. He belonged to Foskett, the gardener. He's an amateur taxidermist. This is his den. Good heavens, it's full of stuffed animals. Then that means... Yes! Stand back, Inspector. Yes, Foskett? Yes, me, now stand back. This duck-billed platypus is loaded. Uh, <laughs> and it's pointing straight at your heart. Don't be a fool, Foskett. You'll never get away with it. Oh, won't I? All right, drop that duck-billed platypus, Foskett. I've got a 12-ball water bowl here, and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> This torturous unholding contains enough explosives to blow us all to smithereens. One false move and I'll pull the pin out. <laughs> so, Mrs. Codpiece, you and Foskett were in league all the time. Yes, yes, we were. We are lovers, Inspector Horn. Foskett did it. She made me do it. I didn't want to. She forced me to do it. She said it'd get a laugh. What? <laughs> That joke about the baked beans. <laughs> You'll never get me alive. You will never... Ooh, ooh. Ah! Oh, no, Donald! Don't, don't, don't look, it's not a pretty sight. <laughs> he stabbed himself to death with a stuffed armadillo. <laughs> So ended the case of the tap-dancing monk. <laughs> Mrs. Codpiece was fined for carrying a loaded tortoise without a license. The Chinese laundryman was discharged with a clean sheet. The badger was exonerated and sold his story to the Sunday newspapers and emigrated to Australia where he was able to start a new life as a doorstop. One thing puzzles me, Perry. <laughs> Now, just tell me something. Where did the tap dancing monk come in? Well, Della, it didn't. I just threw it in to make it interesting. Uh huh. <laughs> and now we come to an equally baffling mystery the Fraser Hayes Four. Here to sing a track from their new LP, Colin Jordan at the Golders Green Hippodrome. <laughs> Fraser Hayes Fall. It happened in some valley not so very long ago. There were sunbeams in the snow and the twinkle in your eye. I remember oh so clearly that you nearly then it happened in some valley When you slipped and fell and so did I How did folks let's go for a ride Get your favorite one to sit by his side Cuddle up in the sleigh, giddy up in the gray And away we go While we listen to the sleigh bells ring A yodeling to your baby You will be nice and warm no matter how cold you may Take a look, a little Jack and Jill, they ski down a hill, that's a snow cloud turning. Look, there's a spill, there's a spill on a hill, when you're down, it's a thrill to go up again. Everybody ought to learn to ski, for that's how we first met. We were that Jack and Jill that came down a hill, when I looked at you, my heart took spill, took a spill on a hill, it's a thrill I can't forget. Sunbeams in the snow And the twinkle in your eye I remember oh so clearly That you nearly passed me by Then it happened in some 
And thank you, the Fraser Hayes Fall. That really set my feet tapping and my teeth on edge. Never mind. <laughs> and now, trends. <laughs> this is the part of the show for the trendy, with it, way out pace setters. This season, there's something really outrageous in trousers. Kenneth Williams. <laughs> Well, he'd be more outrageous without them, wouldn't he? For the feather, why? I beg your pardon. <laughs> Say it again, dear. Thank you. Not at all. <laughs> For the fur wise, there's a swing back to the twenties. Yes, raccoon is in. You see, well, the phone's been ringing for hours. <laughs> Perhaps he's in the bath. What on a Tuesday? Coiffure wise, there's still no change. Hair is being swept up this year. Yes, mine was swept up years ago. <laughs> and now, trends in marriage. These days, trendy moderns have no time for romance and courtship. Nowadays, more and more are finding their mates through the good offices of the marriage bureau. Mrs. Clandestine Lustwicket has opened just such an agency in Pont Street, where I went along to interview her the other day. <laughs> Mrs. Lustwicket, could you tell us something about the size of your operation? <laughs> well, ignoring the obvious reply, I would say that I personally handle many hundreds of clients in the course of a year. The only thing I insist upon is that they had excellent references. Before I would introduce any man to any woman, he must first satisfy me with his bona fide. <laughs> Well, as, it, as it's my turn to ignore the obvious reply, we've got to How do you set about finding partners for your clients? We insert an advertisement in this paper, the Matrimonial Times, incorporating the Bird Fancier's Gazette. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me show you some. Look, poverty-stricken artist wishes to meet nude model he can draw on for inspiration. <laughs> and... Um, Look at this. Lady Acrobat wishes to meet man able to support her. <laughs> oh, my dear. Look at this one. <laughs> Look at this one. Young man, go anywhere, do anything, wishes to meet good companion. Oh, you fixed him up? Oh, yes, yes, I did. But I'm afraid he's put a new ad in today. It reads, young man, been everywhere, done everything, wishes to meet good lawyer. <laughs> This idea of advertising for a partner doesn't always work out. I tried it myself once. I myself put an advert in that said, shy teenage radio comedian wishes to meet petite blonde with sense of humour. And they sent me Charlie Drake. <laughs> ah, well, now, trends in food. This week sees the publication of the 1965 Good Food Handbook. In the studio is the editor, Egan Poltergeist. <laughs> Why not try Margaretta's casserole? There's good food and a pleasant, intimate atmosphere is ensured by the fact that they have 18 tables and only four chairs. <laughs> Very chummy. Or there's uh, a traditional Welsh restaurant which has just opened where you can select from many typical Welsh dishes such as Potage Hugh Weldon, um, <laughs> Cocker Richard Burton, uh, Raspberry Fool a la Harry Seacombe. But uh, if you want something that you can be sure of, just ask for the Welsh rabbit. Her name is Blodwyn. <laughs> A number of other restaurants I recommend are named after the speciality of the house. There's the chicken in the basket, specialising in chicken. The pig in the poke, specialising in pork. Then there's a new little bistro opened in Chelsea. It caters for a theatrical clientele mainly, and it has an atmosphere both informal and gay. It's called the Faggot and Pea. <laughs> yes, yes, I know the one you mean, actually. I went there the other evening for dinner. Waiter, waiter. Come in, ducky, give us a chance. <laughs> I've only got the two pairs of hands, you know, just the two. Oh, hello, it's Mr. Yes. Horn and Ed. Remember me, I'm Julian, this is my friend Sandy. Hello. 
Well, we're just working here, filling in between acting jobs. Oh, yeah. I saw you in a commercial on the telly last week. Oh, was it the one where this woman's all distraught about her sink and I come up the plug hole and cut her cleaning time and half of the flourish of Miss Queegee? <laughs> No, it wasn't, oh, I'm sad to say. Yes. Sorry. Have you seen my latest? Mm. The detergent one where I'm the magic clean power man. You must have seen it. Suddenly there's a great puff of smoke and I'm standing there all dragged up like in comms and a cloak. <laughs> <laughs> Supposed to be a superman. Yeah, I know. Then I knock on this woman's door, and when she answers, I start bellowing at her and I say, "You know, have a go at me, lucky dip." But, <laughs> but it's been a bit slack lately. <laughs> We're just filling in in here. Now, what would you like to eat? You, there's, there's our speciality, omelette sur les visage. <laughs> yes. There's the menu, you see. You have your a la carte, your table d'hôte. Ah, yes, see now, let's see. How's your bouillabaisse? Oh, it's naff. You don't want that. <laughs> Well, what would you recommend? Well, I'll read you off the menu. How about this? From the depths of boundless deep, intrepid fishermen bring you succulent morsels of tempting seafood, fried to a deep golden brown, guaranteed to titillate your palate with its sea fry goodness. Yes, yeah, sounds intriguing. What is it? Lump of cod. <laughs> <laughs> and it's served with the proud progeny of King Potato, a crispy delight. It's just a lot of camp chat for chips. <laughs> Fish and chips, that sounds uh, absolutely... Um... Boner. <laughs> yes, I think I'll have that. Oh, and with it, bring me a bottle of that rich yield of Mother Nature culled from the verdant fields of faraway Tuscany and processed by the loving hands of top European scientists that not one nuance of its flavour shall be allowed to escape. What are you on about? A bottle of tomato sauce. <laughs> no. Very... <laughs> Would you care for wine? What have you got? Well, you've got to be a Chateau Neuf de Parp. That's your Pope's Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> There's your Volnay, your pomade. A pomade's nice, and you? You had a drop last night. <laughs> yes, it's a tête de cuvée, but it's got to be chambreed. That's French, you know. It means it's got to be served at the temperature of the chamber. Mm. <laughs> Well, uh, what do you recommend, then? Well, it's all much the same, really. Julian treads the grapes in the kitchen, then we slap posh labels on the bottles and smear them with cobwebs. It's much, <laughs> much more economical. Oh. And if you want your sparkling, I just shove in a spoonful of fruit salts. <laughs> now then, um, what's it going to be? <clears throat> oh, I know, there's a deceptive little shabby might amuse you. Starts by seducing your nostrils, tips toes across your palate and violently assaults your uvula. Does it, man? <laughs> well, I think I'll just have an insolent little brown ale that swaggers down my throat and lies on its back in my stomach, making rude noises. <laughs> well, please yourself. That's one cod and chips and a bottle of brown ale. Mm -hmm. Right little Raymond Postgate you are. <laughs> and what would you have to follow? At a shrewd guess, I'd say termaine poisoning. <laughs> And I wasn't far wrong either. My case comes up on Tuesday, but I shall plead the stomach aches. Now, all that remains for me is to tell you about the limerick competition. Well, look, we've got so many entries, we simply can't plough through them all in one week and get a fair result. So we're still sorting out the ones that started two men in a factory near Cork were eating their soup with a fork, and we'll give you the result next week. All right? Right. Now to this week's uh, first two lines. They are... A professional wrestler from Lee while rehearsing a bout for TV. All right, I'll read them again so you can take them down. A professional wrestler from Lee while rehearsing a bout for TV. And you have to send in the next three lines. And address them not to me, please, personally, but to Round the Horn, care of the BBC, London W1. And to the sender, the best completed limerick, and a free gift of a pair of Ray Martin's guts. <laughs> See you next week. Goodbye. That was Round the Horn, starring Kenneth Horn, with Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, and Bill Pertwee. On the musical side, you heard the Fraser Hayes Four and the Horn Blowers, conducted by Edwin Braden, who also composed the incidental music. The script was written by Barry Took and Marty Feldman, and the recorded program is produced by John Simmons.